until we're willing to apologize. Amen. So we have to learn to apologize. Now, uh, I did a two-year study with a counselor in my city who came to me one day. Uh, happened to be a lady, Dr. Jennifer Thomas. She said, Dr. Chapman, I've been using the five love languages for years in my counseling. And she said, it's helped so many people. But I believe, she said, that people also have an apology language. I said, what do you mean by that? She said, I mean that what one person considers to be an apology is not what another person considers to be an apology. So I think people are missing each other in their efforts to apologize. And as soon as she said it, I resonated with it. Because they've been in my office for years arguing over whether or not he apologized. She would say, I would forgive him if he would just apologize. And he would say, I did apologize. And she would say, you didn't apologize. And he would say, I told you I was sorry. And she would say, that's not an apology. <laughs> so they argued over whether or not he apologized. So we talked a bit about it, and we decided that we would do some research and just find out if this was true. So we asked thousands of people all over the country two questions. When you apologize, what do you typically say or do? Second question, when someone apologizes to you, what would you like to hear them say or do? And their answers fell into five categories. And we later called them the five languages of apology. I promise you, we were not looking for five. I like five, but we weren't looking for five. You see, when someone's apologizing to you, in the back of your mind, what you're asking is, are they sincere? Because if you judge them to be sincere, you're likely willing to rather easily forgive them. But if you think they're just trying to, you know, get behind, get that behind them, and they're not really sincere, it's hard to forgive them. So after two years of research, looking for what a sincere apology looks like, here's what we found. Oh. <laughs> Don't know if you can see it down there, but it's a little dog. It's looking down, sadly. You, if you have an animal, if you have a dog, you've seen that, okay? Now, if you pull this off, your spouse will know that you're sincere. Well, let me tell you what we really found out. Let me share with you what we call the five languages of apology. And I recognize that uh, these may differ from culture to culture, to be sure, because my background is anthropology. I know cultural differences are important. But here's what we discovered in this country. And all five of these are found in the Bible, which leads me to say that anything you discover in social research if it's true, you'll find it in the Bible. Because truth will never contradict truth. Yes. So let me share these with you. Uh, number one is expressing regret. Many times with the word, I'm sorry. But don't ever use those two words alone. Tell them what you're sorry for. I'm sorry that I lost my temper and yelled at you. I'm sorry that I came home an hour and a half late and we've now missed the program. I know you wanted to go. You see, if you simply say to your spouse or anyone else, I'm sorry, they may well be thinking, you certainly are. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say? <laughs> you see, you think you've apologized and, and they think you're giving a character report. <laughs> Tell them what you're sorry for and <coughs> don't ever add the word but I'm sorry that I lost my temper and yelled at you, but if you had not, then I would not. And you're no longer apologizing. You're blaming them for your poor behavior. And my guess is that some of you have a habit of that. So I can tell you how to break the habit if you'd be interested. The next time you hear yourself say to anyone, I'm sorry that I da 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 da, but you stop right there and say, excuse me, erase the book. I'm sorry that I lost my temper and yelled at you. And you will not erase it, but about three times, and you'll break that habit. Now, look at the example of this in the scripture. The first one is Luke chapter 15, verse 21. It's the prodigal son. He says to his father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
if you could just give me a job on the farm, Dad. You, understand? you feel the regret in that? Yeah. You feel how sorry he is for what he did? He deeply regrets what he did. And then David said in Psalm 51, verse 17, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. See, God knows our heart. And when we come to God with a broken heart over what we've done, and we tell him how sorry we are and how much we regret what we did, God is always ready to forgive us. And this is one of the fundamental ways of apologizing, is you're expressing regret. You're trying to communicate how badly you feel about what you've done and how much you regret what you've done. A second apology language is accepting responsibility. I was wrong. Should not have done that. No excuse for that. I take full responsibility. Now, some people have trouble with this. The ones that have trouble with it primarily are those who grew up in homes where their parents seldom ever told them what they did right, but every day they told them what they did wrong. And something inside the psyche of that child says, when I get to be big, I'll never be wrong again. Because to admit that they're wrong and what they did was wrong in their mind takes them back to childhood, that they're no good. Two or three more rounds of that. Every round I got higher, higher, higher. I was screaming at my wife. Can you believe that? Me, screaming at my wife. I was nice to the kids. Got them in the car, drove them to school, have a nice day, da 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 But when I got rid of the kids, I went back to being angry with her. How could I bear it such a scatterbrain woman? This time she's lost my briefcase. I don't know what I'm going to do. Everything I know is in my briefcase. This was before computers. Everything's in my briefcase. My schedule's in my briefcase. I don't know what I'm going to do today. Oh, man. When I got to church where my office is, I did not walk in by the secretaries. I walked in the back door to my office. Folks, when you sin, you don't want to see people. You want to do what Adam and Eve did in the garden, get you a bush and hide behind it and hope God won't see you. I walked in the back door to my office, opened my door, walked into my office, and there was my briefcase. Now I have a choice. I can say to myself, I'm not going to let her know it was out here. Or I could practice what I preach. And if I had done the former, I obviously would not be using this for an illustration. And so I called her. Hi, babe. I found my briefcase. She didn't say anything. She knew there ought to be more to it than that. And so I said, I'm sorry for the way I talked to you. I raised my voice at you. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was wrong. I'd say it was easy. Not always easy. In fact, let's just see if you all can say those words out loud. I was wrong. Let's try it together. I was wrong. Some of you had trouble even on the dry run. I was wrong. Listen to these words. Luke 15, 21, again, the prodigal son. Listen to what he says, talking to his father. I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven and against you. Incidentally, <coughs> anytime you sin against one of God's children, you sin against God. So we have to apologize to God as well as the person we sin against. And then listen to this, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, the word means to agree with. If we would agree with God that what we did was a sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive us. Same principle applies in human relationships, acknowledging that we were wrong. Incidentally, this is the first step in teaching children how to apologize, helping them accept responsibility for their behavior. A four-year-old breaks a cookie and says, it broke. 
Yeah. Yeah. Everybody right. broke. And the parent says, honey, let's say that a different way. I broke the cookie. It's not a sin to break a cookie. We're just trying to help the child accept responsibility for what they did. I broke the cookie. My son and I were in the kitchen one day. He was probably six years old. He accidentally knocked the glass off the table. It hit the floor and broke. And I looked at him, and he said, it did it by itself. <laughs> and I said, Derek, let's say that a different way. I accidentally knocked the glass off the table. And he said, I accidentally knocked the glass off the table. It's not a sin to accidentally knock a glass off the table. I'm just trying to help him accept responsibility for what he did, for his behavior. Accepting responsibility. A third language is offering to make restitution. Offering to make restitution. What can I do to make this right? What can I do to make this up to you? And for some people, if you don't offer to make restitution, in their mind, you're not sincere. I sent the manuscript to this book. The book is entitled, When Sorry Isn't Enough. I sent the manuscript to a friend of mine, a counselor friend of mine in California before we published it, and just asked him if he would read it and give us feedback. And he wrote back and said, Gary, man, th this, this thing's helping me in my marriage. He said, my wife and I agreed that we were going to read this manuscript together. And so he said, well, we read that first one, I'm sorry, and I knew that's what I consider to be a sincere apology. If my wife tells me that she's sorry, man, I can forgive her. I can let it go. So they said, what have I done for 20 years in our marriage? If I offend her, if I hurt her, what do I do? I tell her I'm sorry. And he says, always seemed to me she couldn't let it go. She just couldn't quite get around to forgiving me. She just kind of held on to it. And when we got to this one, making restitution, she said, this is what I've been waiting for for 20 years. Wow. You have never, ever offered to make restitution. All you ever say is, I'm sorry. He said, so Gary, now, I don't and not only say I'm sorry, I said, honey, I know I've hurt you. What can I do to make it up to you? And he said, she always has an idea. <laughs> and when I do it, she can let it go. You see, in her mind, he was never sincere in his apology because she had a different language. She had a different expectation of what, a, what an apology would look like. So... Make, offering to make restitution. Listen to what Zacchaeus said after he encountered Jesus. Luke 19, verse 8. Lord, the people I've cheated, I'll pay back four times what I took from them. That is restitution. Incidentally, for people in business, as well as people in church relationships, this is huge. Let's say you go to a restaurant and a waiter or a waitress accidentally spills something on your clothing. And they say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And maybe they even give you a towel or wipe it off. And you're sitting there thinking, you're sorry? What do you think I'm feeling that? But if the manager comes out and says to you, I understand we had a little accident here. Uh, I'm sure you know it was an accident. And, uh, but listen, I want you to know we value your relationship with us, and this meal is on us. And if you have any idea how much it'll cost to get your clothes clean, I'll give you the cash before you leave tonight, because we value your, your relationship. You'll go back to that restaurant. You understand? They're offering to make restitution. And this is, you, you never know what another person considers to be a sincere apology, so it's not a, not a bad idea to ask people. Is there anything I can do that will make this right? Or can I make this up to you? Uh, and incidentally, whether you use one of these or all of these, it depends on the nature of the offense. You know, if you're in an elevator and you just happen to bump into somebody, you know, that you didn't mean to and just say, I'm sorry, that's, that's probably enough because you don't even have a relationship with that person. But, but let's say, now I know you guys would never do this, but let's just say that you married guys would forget your anniversary. <laughs> you know, no flowers, no candy, no dinner, nothing. 
And so you're sitting there that night, and you look over on the couch, and she starts crying. And you say, honey, what's wrong? And she said, I can't believe you don't know what's wrong. <laughs> and it dawns on you. I doubt that I'm sorry is going to happen. But if you tell her how sorry you are and tell her, honey, I thought about it this on Monday. I thought about it, and I meant to make reservations, and then it slipped my mind. But it's no excuse, honey. It, it was wrong. I'm sorry. But look, honey. We, we, it's not too late. I know we can't do anything tonight, but, but let, let, let me make it up to you, honey. What, what can I do to make it up to you? We can celebrate it another, another day. Let me make it up to you, honey. She'll have an idea. Yeah. A little trip to Hawaii or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, she'll have an idea. Offering to make restitution. Number four is genuinely repenting. Or expressing the desire to change which as you know is what repentance means repentance means you're walking in this direction and you turn around and walk in this direction so re genuinely repenting means that you're you're expressing the desire to change your behavior uh, I had a lady in my office we were discussing some things in, in a counseling setting and she said when I, and I shared these with her and she said, uh, Dr. Chapman, I can give you a perfect example of that one. She said, several years ago when our baby was little, maybe 18 months old, my husband lost his temper with our baby. Baby was crying and he did everything he could to make the baby stop crying and he couldn't get the baby to stop crying. So he lost his temper. He picked up our baby and started shaking our baby. And when he did, she said, I grabbed the baby and said, don't do that to our baby. And I went to the bedroom just bawling. She said, 10 minutes later, he knocked on the door and asked me if he could come in. And we walked in and he said, honey, I can't believe I did that. And she said, tears came to his eyes. He said, honey, you know I love our baby. I can't believe I did that. I feel so bad that I did that. Can we talk? Can you help me? Can we get a plan so I won't ever do that again? I don't ever want to do that again. She said, Dr. Chapman, I sensed he was so sincere that I could forgive him, freely forgive him, in spite of the fact he had done a horrible thing to our baby. You see, this communicated to her that he was sincere. And there are people that if you don't offer to change your behavior, then in their mind, you haven't really sincerely apologized. They're, they're waiting for you to express that desire and change your behavior. Uh, you know, Jesus came preaching repentance. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter preached repentance on the day of Pentecost. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is big in the New Testament and the Old Testament. When people repent, turn away from what they did, turn in the other direction, then God is always willing to forgive. And this speaks deeply to people as well. And then number five is actually requesting forgiveness. Will you forgive me? I hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me. I know this is wrong, and I hope you can forgive me. And some people, and I, and I, mean, I just have to be honest with you, this one never crossed my radar. I never thought about this one. Because I thought, if you're apologizing in any way, wouldn't they know you want to be forgiven? I mean, why would you be apologizing if you didn't want to be forgiven? But for some people, they're waiting to hear you ask for forgiveness. Dr. Thomas shared this idea with her mother. And her mother said, I can give you a perfect example of that at work. I have a friend at work, she said. We've been friends for 15 years. I mean close friends. And I noticed the last couple of days that my friend had been a little cold. And so I said to her on a break, is everything all right between you and me? Incidentally, that's the way friends talk to each other. If you think something's wrong, you ask. Is everything all right between you and me? And she said, my, my friend said to me, you know what I don't like about you? You don't ever apologize. And her mother said, I was shocked. 
I said, what do you mean? And she said, you remember two weeks ago when you did da 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 And she said, yes, I remember that, but I told you I was sorry. And the lady said, I know, but you didn't ask me to forgive you. And her mother said, I was shocked again. And I said, well, then let me ask you to forgive me. I value our relationship, so will you please forgive me? And the lady said, sure. <laughs> It wasn't that she didn't want to forgive her. It was that in her mind, her mother had never apologized. You see how people can miss each other and still be sincere in their apology? So I believe that each of us has a, well, well here, here's, a, here's David. Listen to David asking God to forgive him. Psalm 51, verse 2. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Three different ways David asked God to forgive him. Very biblical. But biblical also to do that in personal relationships. I believe that each of us has a primary apology language, just like we have a primary love language. So if you want to communicate sincerity, you find out what makes what other people consider to be a sincere apology, and you, you voice your apology in a language that's meaningful to them. Now, I have an idea that most of you don't have a fog, foggiest idea of what your spouse considers to be a sincere apology. So I'm suggesting that this afternoon or this evening, you check it out. And just say, honey, about that apology stuff, man, what, 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 do, you, what do you think is a sincere apology? And just let them tell you. And then, and then go back and forth so that you get the idea. You see, so uh, understanding the other person's apology language will help you express your apology in a way that's going to touch their heart about your sincerity. You, you might be very sincere doing what your mother taught you to do, but they had a different mother. And so we have to, re we have to respect that. Now, here's the, other, here's the flip side of that. Now that you know there are different ways to apologize, and I'm not saying this is the only five, this is what we found. Now that you know there are different ways to apologize, let's give them credit if they use one that's not your language. Let's just recognize, well, that's what his mama taught him. So that's all he knows to say. Someone will give him credit for it. You see, we, we, we always are to have a response, and that response is going to be forgiveness. Now, I remember a young man and uh, a young man and his fiance. I was giving uh, this lecture to a group of single adults. And he and his uh, fiance happened to be there. He came up to me after the meeting and he said, uh, Dr. Chapman, he said, I'm not, I'm not real glad I came to this meeting. I said, really? And he said, uh, yes. He said, uh, uh, we sat back there a while ago and, and I asked her what she considers to be a sincere apology and she told me that uh, she would like to hear me say that I'm sorry. And he said, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I can do that. He said, I, I've never said those words. He said, it sounds kind of girly to me. <laughs> and he said, I just, I just don't know if I can say those words. I said, so, he said, so what's that going to mean in our marriage if I can't apologize in her language? His name was Carl, and I said, Carl, let, let me ask you a question. Have you ever done anything in your whole life that you regretted doing? And he said, yeah. I said, well, could you tell me one? He said, well, when my mother died, he said, I came home for the funeral. And the night before the funeral, I went out to the bar, and I was just going to get a drink. But I ended up getting drunk. And so the next morning, I was at the funeral, but I had such a hangover, I don't remember anything that was said at Mama's funeral. And I've always regretted that. I've always felt badly about it. I always felt like I let Mama down because she was always on my case about drinking too much. And so I just feel like I let her down. And I said, well, Carl, if you could talk to your mother right now, what would you say to her? And he started crying. He said, I'm telling you, Mom, I'm so sorry that I went out to the bar. I didn't mean to get drunk, Mom. I really didn't, Mom. I 
love you so much. I feel like I let you down, Mama, and I'm so sorry for what I did, Mama, and I hope you'll forgive me. And I said, Carl, you know what you just did? He said, yeah, I told my mama I was sorry. And then he said, do you think she hurt me? <laughs> I passed him, I don't know what you would say. But I said, yeah, man, I think she hurt you. And I think she forgave me. You know, the Bible does say there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels when a sinner repents. Didn't say that angels were rejoicing. It said rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Maybe God does call people over and say, hey, hey, look at your son down there. He's repenting. Look at him, look at him, look at him. A year later, a couple came back. They were married now. They came to a seminar I was leading. And they came up to me afterwards. And he said, Dr. Chapman, I don't know if you remember me. He said, I said, Carl, I'll never forget you, man. <laughs> he said, well, we're married now. And he said, we just want you to know that we're, things are really going well. And I looked at his wife. I said, listen, does he, does he know how to say I'm sorry? She said, oh, Dr. Chapman, he's so good at it. <laughs> And I said, does he speak your love language? She said, yeah, Dr. Chapman, I love tax school. <laughs> then I went the other way and asked, asked him those, those same two questions. You see, if you don't learn how to love each other and choose to speak it in the language, and if you don't learn how to apologize, you're not going to have healthy relationships. We have to learn how to apologize. So how do you discover your uh, apology language? Let me give you three ideas to help you discover your apology language. Number one. Ask yourself the question that we ask other people. When you apologize, what do you typically say or do? I mean, think back to the last time you apologized. What did you say or do? Now, if you can't remember the last time you apologized, you're probably overdue. <laughs> Second question. In a given situation, ask yourself, what hurts me most deeply about this situation? That'll tell you what you consider to be a sincere apology. If you say, well, what hurts me most is they won't admit that they're wrong. He said he was sorry, but he won't admit that he was wrong. I mean, why can't he admit that he's wrong? So you're telling yourself that's what you consider to be a sincere apology. If you say, what hurts me most is <laughs> she or he doesn't make any effort to, to make it right. They said they were sorry. They said they knew they were wrong, but they don't offer to make it right. That's what hurts me most. So you just told yourself what you consider to be a sincere apology. Or if they say, you know what hurts me most is, they don't ever ask me to forgive them. They tell me they're sorry, they know it was wrong, but they don't ask for forgiveness. So you're telling yourself that's what you consider to be a sincere apology. And the third question is, what could they do or say that would make it easier for me to forgive them? What could they do or say that would make it easier for me to forgive them. You answer those three questions and you have a pretty clear picture of what you consider to be a sincere apology. Then I suggest you share it with each other, okay? Now, apology alone will never restore a relationship. There has to be a response to an apology. And that response is forgiveness. We have to learn to forgive people who apologize to us. You see, forgiveness opens the door to the possibility that forgiveness can happen. But forgiveness is a choice. We either choose to forgive the person or we choose to hold it against them. And forgiveness is always the Christian response. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, God is our model. It says this, be kind to one another forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So we're to forgive each other in the same way that God forgives us. How does God forgive us? If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God doesn't go around forgiving everybody. God forgives people who repent and turn and put their faith in him initially. And the same thing is true with his children. God doesn't forgive us when we sin if we don't confess our sin. What God does is discipline us 
If we don't confess our sin, he disciplines us. Same thing we do with our children. Because he loves us, he disciplines us, Hebrews chapter 12, so that we will confess our sin, so he can forgive us and the barrier can be removed. So we're to forgive others in response to...